before we begin the lesson, I want to invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your creation as we discuss it today. We thank you, Father, for the world that you made in making us in your image and putting us here with a purpose. We're grateful to be designed by you and made by you, knit together in our mother's wombs. Father, we're grateful to have guidance in this life and to have you as our creator so that we're not alone in the universe. And we love you, Father, and we want to extol you and praise your name as we talk about um, this topic today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was having a discussion with Thomas and Tekla uh, Krenzel this week, and uh, we were talking about evolution and some of the things that uh, they have to go through in school, some of the discussions that they have to have with other people, and I thought we would give a lesson on that. Uh, hopefully it will st strengthen our faith um, and maybe correct some misunderstandings we may have. We'll begin like this. There are three assumptions that our culture makes about this topic. Number one, Darwinian evolution is scientifically established beyond reasonable doubt. That's the assumption number one. The second assumption is that any challenges to Darwinism are religiously based. And because they're religiously based, they're therefore unscientific and irrational. And the third assumption is that the scientific community is an open marketplace of ideas with little or no biases. Now, in a spirit of love, I want to challenge those assumptions because Darwinism discourages many people from investigating the Christian faith. And I think, as we'll find out, it's far less well-supported than many people think. So we're going to take our time today thinking critically about Darwinian evolution and pointing out some fatal flaws to the theory. Now, before we do that, it'd be good to just <coughs> define exactly what we're talking about. Charles Darwin lived in the mid-1800s, and he wrote a book called Origin of Species. And in that book, he advanced a theory to explain how species originated. And that was the theory, or that was the, uh, the theory of natural selection. Now, natural selection is different than, let's say, artificial selection, what a dog breeder might do or a plant breeder might do uh, through, you know, if you're going to breed a, a specific kind of dog or whatever, you're going to have an intelligence behind that, guiding the process through some kind of intelligent in intervention. Well, natural selection is unintelligent and without purpose. Nature just favors certain organisms that evolve adaptively and reproduce abundantly. And those who don't adapt, they die out. So it's, you've heard the phrase survival of the fittest. That's where this comes from. And Darwin's theory is that given enough time, this process of natural selection will lead to the development of entirely new species which appear through a gradual process of incremental change. And Darwin claimed that natural selection accounts for the vast diversity of life on Earth that we see. But Darwin didn't know anything about genetics and the complexity of the cell. Now, later on, uh, when genetics and molecular biology kind of advanced, people that held to Darwin's theory, they kind of filled out that theory by claiming that organisms changed into new species by what they called random genetic mutations. And after these random mutations occur, then natural selection kind of kicks in to conserve the beneficial changes in the offspring, and they pass on that, that positive trait through the generations. This is the neo-Darwinian synthesis. This is the prevailing scientific, uh, you know, the prevailing worldview in the, in the scientific community today. It's what most people think. Well, what's the impact that this has had on our world? I think it's, it's, it's huge. If Darwinism is true, then the Bible can't also be true. Richard Dawkins, you've probably heard of him, contemporary uh, biologist uh, and a, a very fierce 
uh, opponent of Christianity uh, and, and an atheist. He wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker. And in that book, this is what he said about Darwinism. He said, Darwinism allows one to be, quote, an intellectually fulfilled atheist because it erases God from biology. It gives atheism a stronger case. Now, most, uh, most of the textbooks in our public school system are gonna present Darwinism as the explanation for the natural world. Uh, David said in Psalm 139 that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. And Paul claimed in Romans chapter one that God has made himself known through nature. But Darwinism says that every aspect of the development of the natural world can be explained according to time, space, and chance, given these mechanisms of random genetic mutation and natural selection. And Darwinism is far more than a biological theory. It's a way for people to make sense of life without God. So the stakes are very high when we're talking about something like this. So let's, let's move on to some icons of evolution. The case for Darwinism relies heavily on several, dis what I think are deceptive icons, uh, more than scientific fact. And these icons are taken for granted ideas put in a pictorial form that keep people from thinking critically about Darwinism. And I'd like to present six to you uh, just briefly here. The first one is the peppered moth. You might recall the peppered moth in your high school bi biology class. I know I do. I can see the picture on the page of my textbook. Well, Darwinists claim that natural selection occurs today <coughs> in the case of this peppered moth. They call it evolution in action. And peppered moths, they come in, in a various shades of gray. And after the Industrial Revolution, over 90% of the moths near Manchester, England, a heavy, heavy, heavily industrialized city, were darker. So the point is, as the pollution darkened the trunks of these trees, the darker moths perched on the trees, they blended in better than the lighter moths. The lighter moths stood out, they became easier prey for the birds. The darker moths survived, they produced uh, the darker moths produced through this, this random genetic mutation were selected by the environment because they were safer from predation. So it was a textbook <coughs> case for natural selection. Or was it? Because some of the new textbooks don't include the peppered moth. Up until the 1980s or maybe closer to the 2000s, um, the peppered moths were the, the poster insects for natural selection. And then a couple of discrepancies emerged. Number one, the darker moths didn't replace the lighter moths in the most heavily polluted areas in England, which would have been expected by the theory. Hmm. Number two, in the rural areas of England, which were less affected by pollution, the frequency of the darker moths was higher than anticipated since the lighter moths are expected to be favored in those areas by natural selection, okay? Number three, when pollution decreased, causing the tree trunks to become lighter, the proportion of the dark moths increased in the north of London, but then they decreased in the south of London. Again, it doesn't quite fit the theory. Then there's the difficulty that these moths don't normally rest on tree trunks. If you just observe them, why then <coughs> was I showed a picture of these moths resting on tree trunks in my high school biology class? And the answer is, it later came out because the moths were placed there by hand. The moths in the photos are dead and they were preserved and they were stuck on the tree trunks and then pictures were taken. But here's the rub about this. There's some just, some just shoddy science going on. Is there some adaptation possibly? Possibly, right? But here's the point I'm trying to make. Even if the peppered moths fit perfectly that evolutionary agenda, 
A change in the color of one species of moth doesn't explain how moths evolved from a previous species, nor does it demonstrate that moths were in the process of evolving into a new species. It's still a moth. So that's the first icon. And the second icon, you uh, will probably recall Darwin's finches. Darwin's finches, another example of you know, supposed evolution in action. So Darwin encountered these different species of finches in the Galapagos Islands in 1835 in his travel there. And the legend is that he took the different species with their different beak sizes as a strong evidence for natural selection. Now Darwin actually never mentions these finches in his book, Origin of Species. They only appear in his diary, one really small entry in, in his journal. But in the 1970s, Peter and Rosemary Grant and a team of scientists went to the Galapagos Islands to study these finches. And in 1977, there was a drought, and there was a significant reduction in the food available for these finches, the seeds. Uh, and the island's population of the medium ground finches declined to about 15%. And the finches that survived tended to have slightly larger bodies and larger beaks than those that didn't <coughs> survive. Listen to what uh, Peter Grant has to say. If drought occurs once a decade on average, repeated directional selection at this rate with no selection between droughts would transform one species into another within 200 years. You can hear the excitement in his pen as he's writing these things down. The point, if you can read between the lines there, you know, if finches continue to change at this rate, then you just wait 200 years and they're gonna be something different. It's a whole new species of bird. Well. If you fast forward to 1982, 1983, some of you are old enough to remember El Nino. Remember El Nino, the tropical storm that came in with, and it brought all this warmth and it brought the rain back to the Galapagos Islands. And lo and behold, the finch food, the seeds, became plentiful again. And when the scientists went back, <coughs> what did they see? The finch beaks devolved back to their previous average size. So instead of cumulative growth in finch beak size, they reverted. So these finch beak variations don't actually prove Darwin's theory. It proves the survival of you know, the, this species and those <coughs> adaptive changes that they make but it doesn't prove the bigger theory. Again, you gotta ask the question, why don't our high school biology textbooks reflect these awkward facts? Not to sound too cynical, but it seems that it doesn't fit that pro-Darwinian lean, that agenda. A third kind of silly example is embryonic development. Uh, the claim was, this is a really old one, that evolution is evidenced right before our eyes in the developing embryo because the development of vertebrate embryos is visually similar to the development of life from one species to another. And so the claim was, uh, Darwin made this claim, but also an, another biologist by the name of Ernst Haeckel made this claim, that the human embryo, as you look at its development, it passes through the stages of a one-celled marine organism, a worm, a fish, an amphibian, a mammal, and then a human. And it recapitulates in miniature the entire evolutionary <coughs> journey. Now, Darwin seized upon this because he knew that the evidence for his theory in the fossil record was non-existent. So he, he appealed to embryology for support and he claimed that the embryos of most species belonging to the same class are very similar in their early stages, and they only become different later on in their development. And this is, again, a, a misconception, and you can see uh, Ernst Haeckel's drawing on, on the left-hand side here has, um, you know, is, is embodying that idea. And I'm quoting here again from Origin of Species. Sorry, I, I should have put this one on the board, but Darwin believed that, quote, the embryo is the animal in its less modified state. 
and insofar it reveals the structure of the progenitor, the idea. So biology textbooks actually relied on these types of drawings, Heckel's drawings, for over a hundred years to promote Darwinism. But they're no longer used because they're misleading. They're misleading for three ways. First of all, they include only those classes and only those orders of embryos that come closest to fitting the theory. So it's very selective in which ones that they choose. Second of all, the drawings aren't good. They distort the embryos to, you know, to, to, to purport to show exactly what they're trying to prove. They're disfiguring the shapes of the animals and their stages. And number three, they entirely omit earlier stages in which vertebrate embryos look very different. So again, you have to ask, why was it used? A fourth icon is uh, Darwin's tree of life. Um, this isn't the picture that Darwin drew in his notebook. It just looks like five lines on a page. It's not a whole lot. But the idea here is that there's this tree of life. And Darwin's theory, what it needs to work is incremental, long-term change with one species evolving into another. So he drew this tree of life in his notebook. And what you've got in his tree of life is you've got s simple, scarce organisms forming the trunk of the tree, followed by numerous organisms of increasingly uh, complex organisms, you know, forming the branches, as well as all of these transitional forms with one species in, uh, you know, evolving into another. So it's, it's trying to, you know, it's, it's claiming to trace our biologic ancestry from complex to simple, you know, the, where life began. Uh, here's, a, here's a quote from Darwin. Now, if, if that is true, then you would expect uh, the fossil record to bear this out, right? So the shallow stuff should be complex and the deeper stuff should be <coughs> simple, but it didn't. Listen to what he says. Just in proportion as this process of extermination has acted on an enormous scale, so must the number of intermediate varieties which have formerly existed on the earth be truly enormous. We should find this great variety and these different transitional forms in the fossil record. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links, he asks himself. Geology assuredly does not reveal any finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. In fact, instead, what people found was something called the Cambrian explosion, where you find many complex organisms suddenly appearing in the fossil record with no traceable ancestors. And during this period of geologic time, all of the major animal groups appear abruptly. They're completely <coughs> formed. It's the exact opposite of what Darwin's theory claims. And all of those transitional forms that were necessary for Darwin's theory to work, none of them are there in the fossil record. And you say, well, okay, well, that was the 1860s or the 1870s. Well, Darwin held out hope in his book that, okay, we haven't found them yet, but surely generations in the future, they'll continue to dig and these transitional forms will appear. Well, our knowledge of the fossil record has increased tremendously since Darwin's time. And the evidence for his theory of evolution has only decreased. There are zero transitional forms in the fossil record. I haven't found one yet. Here's uh, a Christian apologist, Denton, writing on this. He says, the rocks have continually yielded new and exciting and even bizarre forms of life. What they have never yielded is any of Darwin's myriads of transitional forms. Despite the tremendous increase in geological activity in every corner of the globe, and despite the discovery of many strange and hitherto <coughs> unknown forms, the infinitude of connecting links has still not been discovered. And the fossil record is about as discontinuous as it was when Darwin was writing The Origin. Something to consider asking people who believe in Darwinian evolution. Can you give me an example of a transitional species? 
Can you give me one example from the fossil record of one species changing into another? And I guarantee you the answer is that they can't. You might find a kind of fish developing into another kind of fish, but you'll never see any kind of speciation or what we call ma macro evolution. The fifth one is called homology, homology. And guys, I'm sorry, pause here. Uh, I should have said this at the beginning. If you're visiting, this is not a normal sermon. <laughs> uh, like normally, 99% of the time, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna read scripture and we're gonna talk about it. But from time to time, we'll have kind of uh, apologetic lessons like this, um, pointing out you know, some, some flaws and some pervasive theories in the world. And so this is just a, a weird Sunday. So uh, homology, homology. This is when you can see different structures <coughs> performing different functions in different organisms. Sorry, did I say similar structures performing different functions in different organisms? So Darwin claimed that the similarities in body structure between these different species, they prove his theory since he thought it indicated a common developmental lineage. So for example, the, the pattern of bones in a porpoise's flipper is similar to that of the pattern of bones in a bat's wing, although each is used for a different function, right? The porpoise is swimming, the bat is flying. Thus, Darwin's thinking, they must have a common ancestor. He says, um, what can be more curious than that the hand of a man formed for grasping, that of a mole for digging, the leg of a horse, the paddle of a porpoise, and the wing of a bat should all be constructed on the same pattern and should include the same bones in the same relative positions. This is <coughs> what you would call jumping to a conclusion, right? It's a kind of fact-free reasoning. It's an unjustified <coughs> assumption. According to Darwin, the unguided process of natural selection was a better explanation for homology than design, intelligent design. My question is, why should God use entirely different structures for different purposes when similar structures accomplish different goals just as well. If you think about it, human designers use similar structures for different purposes all the time. So there can be a kind of economy in design with God. If it, if it works, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, the kind of, this kind of idea. It's, it's just, there's no basis for it. There's no basis for it. And then lastly here, before we conclude, is vestigial organs. So supposedly the human body contains these different organs or these structural remnants inherited from our animal predecessors that you know, now they don't serve any purpose. They're vestigial. They're kind of like evolutionary leftovers. But the more people learn about the human body, the more vestigial organs are crossed off these lists. So the human coccyx, or the, is that how you say that? The tailbone? I don't know. Uh, the tailbone, it was viewed as one of these vestigial organs. It, 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 people used to think it was the remnant of a tail. Uh, no joke. And then later on, later on, doctors learned that it's a crucial point of contact with muscles that attach to the pelvic floor. So it does have a purpose. Uh, the human appendix was also thought to be vestigial, but it's shown to have, you know, be a functioning component in the immune system. The pineal gland, uh, people thought it was a, some kind of degenerate eye and it didn't have any function. Uh, again, one of these evolutionary leftovers. But now we know um, it's an endocrine gland uh, that has important functions. Same thing with the thymus and the thyroid glands. They, they were thought that they were, you know, just worthless, but now it's clear uh, that the thyroid is an endocrine gland as well. It secretes these different, you know, uh, important hormones in the development of the body and so forth. And those of you who have like a thyroid issue, you understand, right? You've got to take medication for this kind of thing. And then another thing is um, the so-called junk DNA uh, that, you know, certain aspects of DNA that, that some people regard as, as vestigial because they don't contain any, new, any genetic information and they don't seem to serve any purpose. Well, geneticists later learned that they're very important to the regulation of gene activity. So again, the more we learn, uh, the less vestigial organs or structures are on the list. 
So we've got some problems with Darwinism. I hope that you can agree that there are some major issues with this. Um, the if we had to kind of summarize here, the first is extrapolation. You know, most of the cases that we just mentioned, they show a reliance on extrapolation. So the examples of the, remember the moths and the finches. Even if they're successful in showing the small adaptive changes in populations, they don't provide any evidence for one species developing into another species. This is the difference between microevolution, small, observable, adaptive changes, which totally fits within a Genesis 1 context, and macroevolution, or speciation, one species evolving into another, which does not fit within the Genesis 1 narrative. Uh, I sh again, I should have put this on the board, sorry. Norman Macbeth, another uh, Christian apologist, this is what he had to say. If you observe the growth of a baby during its first months, extrapolation into the future will show that the child will be eight feet tall when he is six years old. Can you see that? Those of you who have children have seen you know, these kind of images of, of infants growing. Therefore, all statisticians recommend caution in extrapolation. Darwin, however, plunged in with no caution at all. So I hope you can see that it's not fair to see that cumulative, linear kind of growth and say, well, aha, because they change this much now, surely there'll be a new species a couple of hundred years in the future. The second thing is mutation. Uh, the second problem is mutation. Darwin's theory hinges upon positive genetic mutations being carried over into the next generation. But mutations occur seemingly incoherently, like without any kind of rhyme or reason. And they're not ever complementary to one another, nor are they cumulative in the next generation. Mutations only <coughs> modify what currently exists. A mutation has never added any new genetic information to an organism, let alone a new body part. And let's not forget the fact that most mutations are detrimental to the organism. If, so, if an animal or something is born with a genetic mutation, it probably won't survive, right? Because it's outside of the range of survivability about how God designed it. So they don't produce evolution. So natural selection, far from generating these new organisms, has this kind of stabilizing effect. It brings populations back to the norm needed for survival. Again, think of those beaks of those finches. They got bigger when there were less food, and then they got smaller again. They reverted back to the average when food was plentiful again. And again, when we read Genesis chapter 1, God tells us there that he created each animal according to its kind. And species can change and adapt within that limited range, but they always will revert back to the average for survival. Again, that's consistent with Genesis chapter one. And then the last thing I wanna mention here is presuppositions. Darwinian evolution has become so embedded and accepted in our culture that anyone who opposes it is dismissed as a moron. And I say this because I used to be one of these people. Anyone who said that evolution wasn't real I just looked at them blankly, like how could you, this is an accepted fact, right? This is what everyone knows this, right? All the smart people in my life believe this. Why don't you believe it? And so since people think the issue is settled, they don't think it's even necessary to engage in a debate or a dialogue or present any kind of evidence on their view. Where does this intellectual arrogance come from? Well, by and large, the scientific <coughs> community holds a prior commitment to absolute materialism, a refusal to believe in anything outside of the natural or the material world, and any reason for life that might be supernatural or immaterial, something like intelligent design, Genesis chapter 1, is completely thrown out. Now, is that very scientific, to have a prior <coughs> commitment to one view. And I'm not just making this up. This isn't just you know, something that you know, is just subjective. No, this is from the mouth of someone like uh, Richard Lewontin, 
He's an eminent biologist, and he's a fierce defender of Darwinian evolution. He says, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept the material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. More, uh, moreover, that materialism is an absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And we send our kids to college and we never have this discussion with them? Parents, we can do better than this, right? We must do better than this for their sake. Rachel, 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 <laughs> Rachel took a, what was it? Was it evolution or was it? She took an evolution class in causes BC. This is before we were Christians. And this guy's going through all the evidence, and he's, and he's presenting it as a theory. He's, he's being a, you know, he, he believes in it, but he's, he's, he's trying to be a good teacher. And Rachel asked the question, so wait, so this isn't proven, it's just a theory. And the guy said, yeah, it's just a theory. I don't think all the teachers are that honest. <coughs> and certainly, a lot of kids you know, our kids' age, when they go to college, they're going to accept this as fact. Are we going to send them off out into the world without any kind of help, without any kind of support? So we need to have lessons like these. We need to have conversations at the dinner table about these kinds of things. And we need to understand the facts about this. So Darwinism runs more on a prior commitment to naturalism, an anti-supernatural stance, than it does on hard empirical evidence or good arguments. I don't believe it. And these icons of evolution are more like idols that hinder a sober investigation of truth. But what's more than all of this stuff, all of these little conversations we have about Darwin's finches, or the stickleback fish, or bacteria evolving into another bacteria, or something like that. Forget all that for a second. What are the implications <coughs> of this worldview, if you accept it? The Bible claims that our world is designed by a supernatural mind whose fingerprints are scientifically observable. Darwinism presents a world alone, unguided by God, According to Darwinism, we are the result of time and matter and chance. You are a cosmic accident. You have no purpose. You have no morality. You have no soul. And you have no hope beyond this life. So not only do we have problems with the scientific theory, but we have existential problems with holding that view. How we think of ourselves, how we think about this world, it, should, it shapes the way we, we, we treat other people. It shapes the, the way that we, we make choices in life. So this kind of foundational stuff is important because we're building our lives on this worldview. So which one would you rather have? Would you rather have the one that's unsubstantiated by any kind of scientific evidence that leaves you with no hope? Or I know we didn't present a positive case for uh, intelligent design, but we could do that on a future occasion and we can see the evidence that it bears there, and it's a message with hope. It's a message that can really help you thrive as a human being, as God intended. So where does that leave us, guys? Uh, what does scripture say? Well, God created the universe out of nothing. Genesis 1 says that he created each kind of creature spe specially, not through this long naturalistic process of macroevolution. And species, they may change, they may adapt to their environment in various limited ways. We can see that given the natures that God has given them. But God created humans uniquely in his image 
not through a long process of naturalistic evolution. Therefore, we are not alone. We have purpose. We have meaning. We're designed and we are loved by God, and we can move forward in hope in this life no matter what happens. <coughs> I hope that you share that worldview, that biblical worldview, and I hope that that encourages you as you live your life and as you have conversations with your neighbors about this kind of thing. And most especially, I hope that you share this with your children and have those discussions. Look, another thing, sorry, I'm long on time here, but another thing, we don't want to make the same mistakes that you know, Darwinists make about shoddy science. There are lots of terrible arguments for intelligent design. We don't want to make those arguments, but there are plenty of good ones too. So let's equip our young people to go out into the world and to help people get closer to God. We're going to sing uh, a song in just a moment, and I want to invite anyone whose life isn't right with God. If you need the prayers of this church or if you uh, even need to be baptized into Christ today, we can assist you. Let's stand up and sing together. <laughs>